Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone, um, and thank you very much for coming along. My name is Stephen Mackay, and I work in the School of Planning, Architecture and Civil Engineering at Queen's. I'm here to speak to you for a few minutes uh, about the planning enforcement system. And just before we drill down into the issues, I'll provide you with some contextual information in case you're not terribly familiar with the planning system. Really, with the, with the devolution of powers back on the, on the 1st of April 2015, we, we moved into what I suppose you could call a new planning paradigm. And that in that context, it's really essential that we have a framework that is fit for purpose. And when I speak about a framework, I'm referring to the framework for mainstream operational planning, which is comprised of three key strands. Of course, you have development plans, you have development management, and you have enforcement. Now, development plans, just in case you're not really up to speed with it, are tools for decision making. They're tools for development management. They contain policies, proposals, maps and diagrams. So if someone wants planning permission, that document, if you like, the development plan, it's really the tool for the decision making process. It informs the development management process and the proposal is either approved or refused. So those are the first two key strands. The third strand of the mainstream planning system is enforcement. It's effectively the field safe. And the system, it's really there to do two things. It's there to remedy the effects of unauthorised and undesirable development. And it's also there to take legal action against those who flout, who flout planning legislation. So development planning, development management and enforcement, they're, they are, they're mutually reinforcing and interdependent. If you like, they're inextricably linked. If you undermine any one element of that, what is effectively a planning trinity, you undermine the entire legitimacy of the planning system. Um, a lot of research has been done on this in the past, really, in the 1970s, you had the Dobry Report in 1975, Carnworth 1989, and so on. And traditionally, planning enforcement has been identified as the weakest link. So traditionally, sorry, traditionally it has been labelled the Cinderella of the planning system. And as we move into this new era for planning, that's really the focus of this, this short talk that I'm going to produce here today. And I suppose the key question is, it's really whether the enforcement system is fit for purpose or whether it needs a bit more work. That's, that's really what I would like to talk about. It's a huge topic in itself, but what I'll try to do is just relate to a couple of points, which I hope you find are of some interest to you. Now, the starting point in this context is uh, really to develop an understanding of the meaning of development, the word development. It might sound a little bit strange, but this is far-reaching consequences regarding the issues I'm about to summarise to you. Uh, I'm going to scrutinise and unpack them here in a moment or two. But if we go back to section 23, I think it is, of the Planning Act, development, the definition of development is it's the carrying out of building, engineering or mining operations in, on, under or over the land, or the making of any material change in the use of buildings or any other land. And that de definition, it goes across the different jurisdictions, England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland as well. And I'll come back to it in a moment or two, because hopefully it'll become quite relevant. As I say, it's divided into these two key strands, operational development, building engineering and mining, and material change of use. Okay, I don't often like to look at the past, but in this case here, I think it is important just to, to relate back, to look at what happened in the past, because that will help us to develop a deeper understanding of what's going on today. So I just want to mention a couple of points which will drive the rest of the talk. The first one is the Town Country Planning Act of 1947 for England, which you might think is, well, blimey, what relevance has that got here? But the point is, it is effectively the central plank of the planning enforcement system. It was then, and it still is today, because many of the mechanisms which were introduced under that are still in place. All albeit somewhere in a slightly modified form. The key thing really is the principle of discretion, and that for the most part, um, it's not normally an offence to carry out development without planning permission. Now, there are exceptions to that. You have things like um, development which is unauthorised in the context of listed buildings, demolition and conservation areas, cutting down trees which have tree protection orders or tree preservation orders on them, so those are, are, are slightly different. But it can of course become an offence, but it's at the discretion of the planning system or the planning authority who can take enforcement action or let matters rest as they are. Second thing I want to mention to you here briefly is the four year rule. This also came in in 1947 and effectively what that did was it the, the thinking was that if something has not been picked up after a period of four years, well, it couldn't have been that important. Therefore, it, become, it became immune from enforcement action. Now, there was one exception to that, and this is quite important, and that was for mining. When the period, the clock only started to tick after the period of discovery, the point of discovery. Okay, And, of course, we, we might learn something from that. 
Then we have the enforcement notice. The enforcement notice was the key tool or the key weapon in the enforcement armory back then. Again, it still is today. And when an enforcement notice was served, the recipient would have had a number of options. He or she could have complied with the notice. They could have applied for retrospective planning permission, or they could have appealed to the magistrate's court. And herein um, lies one of what is perceived by some to be one of the key difficulties of the planning enforcement system, the magistrate's court. It has been perennially criticised on two grounds. First of all, for being an inappropriate arena for dealing with the technicalities and complexities of planning law. And secondly, for protecting private property rights. I'm not saying, well, that's, that's definitely the case or not, but that criticism has emerged in the literature over the years, and we'll turn our attention to it in a moment or two. Final point I want to make here in terms of setting this up is really between 1947 and 1990, changes to the planning enforcement system were much more systematic rather than radical. But there was one thing that happened in 1968 in England over the 1968 Town and Country Planning Act. And that was that they had picked up that this definition of development wasn't really working. The four-year rule wasn't working. And that's because they identified the difference between operational development and material change of use. With regard to operational development, it's usually a building or something. You can see it on the ground. It's easy to spot. Not so with necessarily with material change of use, because that could take place within a building. It could take place very subtly, uh, almost by... <laughs> they could almost become immune by default, and it would not be picked up. And say it's notoriously difficult to spot. So what they did was they brought in this differential between the two, and that was really formalised properly in 1990 in England under the 1990 Town and Country Planning Act and subsequently the Planning and Compensation Act of 1991. And what they did at that time was they said, OK, for operational development, which you can spot, we'll have a four-year rule, but for material change of use, with one exception, which was change of use to a residential dwelling, we're going to have a 10-year rule. OK, give us more time to pick up on things. So that's the way it stood. And that was then transposed to Scotland, well, it applied to Wales as well, and of course Scotland. And of course, with most planning legislation, it's imported piecemeal across the Irish Sea, albeit at a later date. So we had a four-year rule and 10-year rule, which I think were introduced under the planning amendment, Order 2003. So that's the way it stood. Okay, let's turn our attention. I mentioned the magistrate's court was seen as being, has been seen by some as being problematic. So if we look at a couple of cases here uh, in this particular jurisdiction, this is one, we go back to 2010, okay, it was in the middle of the crisis. Um, and it was the demolition of a B1 listed building at Piney Ridge on Malone Road. It was, as you know, very lucrative land. Um, that's, that's it there, so it's not a great picture of it, but it's, to me, it's a, I suppose, what would you call that? It's an arts and crafts house. I think it's a very, very, very pretty house, but it's on a big, big site. And of course, if you're going to tamper with that, you need planning permission. But of course, it was tumbled. And it was successfully prosecuted. But following the prosecution, the magistrate's court found the offender £150, and the company of which he was a director, £200. So... It was a case of whatever you're having, lads, on the site after that. Uh, the, this, is, this is an interesting one as well, and I think it's quite relevant. I'm not getting at the department here. I think the department have done a lot of good things. But they didn't include a condition to reinstate the building in the listed building enforcement notice that was then served. And whilst that could have been a mistake, and mis people make mistakes, the point about it is that the enforcement equation is a very complex one to remedy. Um, but one of the components that you do have to have, you do have to have appropriately trained staff who've got breadth and depth of experience. And I think there is actually a deeper issue here in terms of the culture and structure of the enforcement system in this jurisdiction. But I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at the department specifically. OK, case two, and this is a very famous one. It happened just before uh, Piney Ridge. It's Harry Mount House in Waringstown, which was a, a listed dwelling. And it actually had permission for um, to carry out um, uh, alterations to the, to the listed listed building, but as often happens, on a Saturday morning, the bulldozers were in, they hit the building, and the, the argument was it had fallen down. But subsequently, it was prosecuted, and the total fine imposed by the court was £50,000, the highest in this jurisdiction. And the outcome, the highest ever issued in the jurisdiction and seen as a major breakthrough in terms of the planning prosecution being supported by the courts, which effectively torpedoes everything I have said so far. But on appeal, the £15,000 fine imposed on each of the two owners was reduced to £500, and the contractor's £20,000 fine was reduced to £100. Again, so it's not great signals being sent out. Now, these are extreme cases. So does the problem prevail elsewhere? Well, the literature suggests that it is perceived as a problem. 
um, throughout GB, not just to the same extent as it has been here and also the Republic, I'll turn to in a moment or two, and particularly in the context of built heritage. The English system in particular does seem to have a better structure in terms of how local authorities deliver. And, and coupled with that, even though they have very powerful organisations like English Heritage, which, which do, do seem to do a very good job in terms of looking after things, they, they do have, have serious problems there. Uh, what about in the south? Well, again, I've done some follow-up stuff here. Even over the last week, I got to follow up on this a bit. And a snapshot, snapshot sorry, suggests that similar issues prevail in Dublin, Cork and Limerick. And in Leitrim, the quote was really this. We've almost given up on prosecuting as the courts either let those who flagrantly flout the law off the hook or fail to impose a significant deterrent. So it's, it's not a good picture down there. They have a slightly different enforcement system, by the way, which is quite interesting. And some interesting nuances which we might be able to learn from. Um, however, has there been a paradigm shift since 2012? Um, what I'm saying here is if you start to look at a couple of cases, okay, we have £30,000 uh, fine issued for non-compliance with two enforcement notices, one for unauthorised operational development and the other for material change of use. Similarly, on the 6th of June 2012, £20,000 imposed uh, for non-compliance with planning enforcement notice sought for demolition of an authorised dwelling in list below. Okay, so those are, those are, it looks as if, well, okay, maybe there has been a change in culture, a change in thinking by the magistrate's court. Now, the rationale for the change. At that time there, I think it's quite important to remember, Alex Atwood was the Minister for the Environment, and he took a very proactive interest in enforcement, specifically built heritage. So we had a conference and we had a number of seminars. I attended a few of the seminars, and they were really good. And at that time, new sentencing guidance was issued to the magistrate's court. Well, there's a connect there or not, I'm not 100% sure, but the minimum fine threshold then moved to £5,000. Um, so, I mean, again, initial discussions here, <laughs> I haven't any money to do anything more on this here, but there is a perception of leniency. Um, if we take this one here, again, this was round about the same time. And another listed building demolition, this is the before, the before and this is the after. Okay, and again, the fine was £5,000, a lot of £5,000, minimum fines being issued. It would have taken more than £5,000 to tumble it, never mind take away the, the, the rubble afterwards. So again, very much question marks have been emerging over the magistrate's court. Um, so at this point in time, fines issued to major offenders still perceived to be a problem. I've been talking to a lot of enforcement officers, and early evidence suggests that generally the super councils, there may be not through their own, not wanting to, but having to put enforcement onto the back burner. So many other things are going on at the moment. Again, it's, we need more work on that. Quite interesting here, again, I've been uh, torpedoing the poor magistrate's court, but and this is a development which took place in England in 2014, and they have actually come up with a specialised planning court to deal with the te technicalities and complexities of planning law contained within the High Court. And appeals may also, in certain circumstances, be proceed directly to the Supreme Court. Again, premature to evaluate how good that is, but there are some very positive messages coming back at the moment. It seems to have, have effective, more effective. But again, whether or not we could have something like that here, I think a big question mark would be over to maybe 50 million people as opposed to maybe 1.6 million people. So they have the critical mass over there to, to maybe to justify something like that. Anyway, finish off issue two. Time limitation, which I touched on at the beginning, and we, I mentioned to you that under the Planning Compensation Act and the amendment order here in 2003, we moved from a four, to a four-year rule and a ten-year rule. Now, <clears throat> in preparation for this paradigm shift or moving devolution of powers back to, to the government, again, a lot of really good work has been done in terms of researching the existing system as it was there, uh, looking at what's good, what's bad, how can we make it better as we move forward. So we had a huge consultation uh, exercise conducted in uh, 2009. Then the findings from that were fed through into the planning bill and then we had the planning act which, which was sub subsequently enacted. Now whenever the planning bill came out in November 2010, the, sorry, the consultation to reform looked at planning enforcement and it effectively said that okay four and ten not, we know there's this problem with time limitation particularly with material change of use but as it stands let it run. Um, the planning bill came out 2010, and the section, relevant section, said four years and ten years. We actually, as Susie was saying, we were actually employed to scrutinise those pieces of information and then to present to the Environment Committee. And we didn't expect anything to happen at all, but whenever the Planning Act came out in 2011, it contained section 132, and section 132 states this. 
Where there has been a breach of control consisting in the carrying out without permission of building, engineering, mining or other operations, no enforcement action may be taken after the end of a five year period. So in other words, the four jumped to five, but this is the one that is of great concern. In the case of any other breach of planning control, no enforcement action may be taken after the end of the period of five years beginning with the date of the breach. And one thing which is probably quite strange as well is that very often the legislation is not commenced immediately. Most of the leg almost all of the legislation in the Act was commenced in 2015 whenever the transfer of powers took place. This was commenced almost immediately. There was huge, it wasn't just a huge outcry from community organisations such as Friends of the Earth, but I spoke to a lot of planning enforcement officers who were really, really concerned about it and they said it became chaos. They were trying to get enforcement notices out the door because a lot of five-year changes of use were about to become immune from enforcement action. So despite this, this was actually brought up at um, a number of the ministerial meetings and the, uh, the seminars, but no satisfactory answer was ever really given as to why this actually occurred. Anyway, notwithstanding, so what? Uh, we're talking about evidence and evidence-based policy. So really, this was all done in the light of a lot of evidence that had been produced again in England. So really from the beginning of the millennium, the DCLG, Department for Communities and Local Government, as it was back then, it did a lot of work uh, on time limitation and it came back and it effectively said, well, okay, we need to have at least 15 years for material change of use. And Richard Humphreys, QC, writing in the Journal of Planning Law, again, he's a, he's a big, big hitter in terms of uh, planning enforcement cases. He said that 20 years of the 10-year rule this paper was called 20 Years of the 10-Year Rule Time for Reform, and what he was arguing was not a reduction to a five-year immunity period, but a doubling to 20 years. Okay, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and then, on the back of that, this was all quite an interesting time in planning enforcement history because we had a number of associated history, issues, and you probably have seen these already, so apologies if you have. The big one is concealment and time limitation. Again, it's one of the big issues in England. Of course, I'm sure you've seen this. This is Robert Fidler's castle. Um, Mr. Fiddler built his, his gas castle with battlements, etc., inside this, uh, the straw bales and covered it with the tarpaulin. He actually started to build it in 2002 and he lived in it until 2009. And then, of course, he removed the tarpaulin and he applied for a, a lawful development certificate to regularise it because four years had passed, the clock had been ticking. So, this was the, the rule of the court. An enforcement notice may be issued within the period of four years from the date of the breach. <coughs> Now, Forbes, the judge, stated, in my view, the inspector's findings of fact make it abundantly clear that the erection of the straw bales was an integral, indeed essential part of the operation designed to deceive the LPA, Local Planning Authority. So what he was saying was that um, something can only be lawful whenever it is substantially complete, but he was saying that it was not substantially complete until the tarpaulin was removed. So in other words, the clock started ticking when Mr. Fiddler took the tarpaulin off the bales. Many saw that to be a really, really unsatisfactory decision. Okay? But the key point, that wasn't a big deal in itself, the key point here was it was accepted at that time that concealment does not in itself provide a legitimate basis for the council to succeed, as hiding something does Something does not take away the lawful rights that accrue due to the passage of time. In other words, the clock keeps ticking even though you've concealed it. Okay? Um, I think that comes from a 2006 case, uh, FSS versus Aaron. But subsequently, really on the back of this, and this, was, this is the Beasley's new house, what the Beasley's did, they were watching carefully what was going on in the Fiddler case, <clears throat> and they got permission for an agricultural building, which is quite easy to do, of course, in England. It's quite close to Wellman Garden City. Um, this is a luxury dwelling house inside. Okay, so they lived in it until the period had expired, and then they applied for a lawful development certificate, as you do. It's been there four years, it wasn't concealed, you know, so you didn't have to take any tarpaulins away. So therefore they applied for the LDC. Now this um, went through all of the processes. It was refused by the planning authority, allowed on appeal, reversed at the High Court. The High Court decision was reversed on appeal, but the Supreme Court set aside the LDC. Okay, and this is the key ruling here. It's called positive deception. The court's opinion was that dismissing the case would damage confidence in the law. I think it's a really good quote. Parliament had not intended such an outcome. Dishonesty must not be crowned with success. I think that comes from a thing called the Connor Principle, where uh, someone is not allowed to benefit from his own wrongdoings. I think that's where that was drawn. I'm not quite sure, but I think that's what it is. Anyway. Hence, Mr. Fiddler's conduct was also subsequently deemed to be a case of deception. 
so the stop the draw wheels didn't really matter that much. Okay, and then what England have done again on the sixth of April two thousand and twelve, they produced the Localism Act, and again maybe we can learn something from this, maybe not. But local authorities are now provided with a six month window in which to take action against concealed breaches of planning control. Um, the period commences from the date on which a breach is discovered, regardless of whether the discovery was made after the usual immunity period. So if we go back to the beginning of this talk here with regard to mining. They had said that because that was particularly difficult to spot, that the clock only started. So that's what they're saying there. Okay, so maybe we can learn something from that. Anyway, going forward, we're moving into this new era of planning where policy making, decision making must be seen to be beyond reproach. We've come from a very dark past. Uh, questions still do exist around the development and commencement of immunity legislation. There's still a lot of concerns out there. And if we're to maintain the legitimacy of the planning system, well, maybe we need to, to revisit some of these issues and where appropriate, and if we can, try to identify remedies. And just yesterday, um, this is a picture taken of Mr. Fiddler's house last week. Uh, he was threatened with imprisonment uh, back about two or three months ago, but he is now in the process of actually beginning to demolish the castle. So this is where it is at the moment. So that concludes my short talk. Thank you all very much. Thank you.